Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. I'm really excited. I've been super excited to welcome the special guest on to um, another episode of the Nonprofit Show because he is not only somebody that walks the walk, but he's doing amazing work. And I'm talking about Ron Brooks, CEO of Accessible Avenue. Ron, you are the very first blind guest that we've had on. And to talk about this accessibility issue um, is fabulous because I think a lot of times we have guests on the show, well-intentioned, well-meaning, well-educated, but they might not have always been on the path that they advocate for. And I'm not saying that as a, you know, to demean any of any of this, but to have you on, um, being that you have walked this walk is mm -hmm. really, really remarkable. And I think we can learn so much from you. So um, I'm really excited about this. And we titled this show, Nonprofits Need to Think Beyond the Bus accessible transportation. And so this is going to really be one of those conversations that I think sticks with us, all of us, for quite a long time. Another thing that we're really excited about are our sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These folks join us day in and day out so we can have amazing conversations like we're going to have with Ron Brooks today. So Ron, as CEO of Accessible Avenue, tell us about what you do and what Accessible Avenue does. Oh, sure. Thanks. Well, first off, thank you for having me. I'm really um, excited to be here. Um, and I just want to say, uh, before we even start, that um, I've spent quite a bit of my time working in the nonprofit space, not as an employee, but as a board member for several organizations and volunteer for several others. And, uh, you know, you commented on the fact that I've lived experience as a person, uh, you know, who is blind, a person with disabilities. Um, and and I, I will tell you that in some ways that makes my journey easier, because for me, I don't have to figure out my why in, in terms of these issues. These issues affect every day that I walk around on planet Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm living the reality that I'm in. And so I, I really respect people who come into a nonprofit space to, to help other people and to serve their community. Um, and especially when it may not be your journey, because you've got to actually figure out why this matters to you. And so for for folks that don't have lived experience, it's it's probably a little bit harder in some ways. I mean, for me, I know what it's like to be in a world that's 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 a little bit harder to navigate uh, because I'm in it. And for those of you who aren't as close to that, you've got to actually work to get there a little bit. So I really respect people who make that effort and who do that work because it's important. So in terms of Accessible Avenue, um, I found an accessible avenue sitting at my kitchen table, which is about 40 feet from where I'm sitting right now in my house in Phoenix. <laughs> and uh, I, I started it because I'd been in the public transportation industry for a long time, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but the reason I started it, it was because I wanted to use the experience that I had accumulated uh, both as a, as a blind person and as a transit professional to try to help my industry, public transit, be um, you know, learn and do better at serving people with disabilities. Uh, and we do that in a couple of ways. We provide advice and consulting to transportation agencies, uh, agents, uh, serve, uh, companies who contract with transportation agencies. Uh, those could be people who, you know, companies that provide the service, they could be companies who develop technology for the industry, uh, really helping them understand what is needed by people with disabilities who use those services and who need access to transportation. The other thing we do is we work with the community. So folks with disabilities, advocates in the community to try to help them understand how this industry works. Uh, and how they can be a, effective advocates. It's a big industry. 
It has its own rules of engagement. It's complicated. It has jargon, all the stuff that you would expect. And people have to learn it. And it's hard. And so we're there to try to help people navigate this industry so they can get the best service that they that they can get and the service that they need. You know, Ron, it's it's fascinating because you and I are both from the same community and I'll call mm-hmm. us out. You know, Phoenix is the fifth largest city in America. We are not known for our uh, community, you know, transportation mm-hmm. um, systems. I mean, I think we work hard at it and we've really tried to innovate and do some things. And we're in that story. We're in that journey. How how's your journey been when we think about this is, you know, being a blind man and Mm -hmm. then leaning into transportation. I think that's a fascinating story in itself. Can you share with us what that, that has been like for you? Oh, sure. I mean, first off, I came by it, honestly. I mean, for me, transportation has always been a challenge. So when I was born, I wasn't born in Phoenix. I was born in a, uh, in Indiana, small uh, Midwestern community, um, and I was a kid who could see. I, I didn't see well. I was a low vision kid, but I could see well enough uh, to ride bikes and play basketball, which is what everybody in Indiana does. Um, <laughs> I was I was watching a game the, this weekend, and and they said the the commercial was in Indiana we grow basketball, and I thought that was about right, um, and, and soybeans. Uh, but anyway, I loved basketball, and so I was about fourteen. And I was a freshman in high school and I was playing a pickup game of basketball. And I could barely see by this point. My eyesight was terrible, but I could still see well enough to play basketball or so I thought. And we were playing a pickup game, just neighborhood kids, no referees, um, just, you know, which means it was kind of like basketball crossed with football or something. (laughs) But anyway, I took a shot. The ball came really hard off the rim and I didn't see it in time and it hit me in the face. And it created uh, 12 hours later, I couldn't see. So mm. uh, so that was tough. I mean, I was a freshman in high school. Um, mm. It was probably going to be a tough year anyway. My eyesight was getting kind of terrible, but uh, but it happened all at once. And so I had quite a bit of learning to do um, quickly. Uh, I learned, I, I took a few weeks off of school um, to, to, I remember sitting in a chair for two weeks upright because the small town doctor uh, in my in our, in our town, thought that if I sat upright, the hemorrhage that I had probably caused would go away on its own, and I'd be fine. Mm. And this didn't happen. So after two weeks of really bad sleep, sitting up, uh, I gave up and realized this is my new reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I learned Braille, uh, which of course is the raised dots that mm-hmm. that uh, blind folks can read, or or some blind folks can read. Uh, I learned how to use some technology, uh, and I went back to high school. And got through high school, but I got through high school literally depending on other people for every bit of my mobility. So um, I didn't have training for how to walk around in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I didn't have access to public transportation uh, at that point. I, I couldn't drive. I was literally dependent on my mom, my dad, or my sisters to go absolutely everywhere that I wanted to go. And I lived all the way through high school that way. So as my sisters were getting their driver's licenses, I wasn't. Um, and in my town, un- I mean, Phoenix, you know, it may not be perfect, but you can actually get around town on public transit here. Not in my town. Y- you had to have a car or you weren't going. And so that's how I, that's really where I started. So I did pretty good in school. I, I took it pretty seriously. I got to college and then I went to graduate school in San Francisco. Ooh. and. I wasn't really interested in transportation at this point, except as a user of it. I mean, I was going into international relations. I wanted to be a professor or maybe uh, work in development, you know, third world development or or something. I didn't know. Uh, But I wasn't interested in transportation, except that transportation was transformative for me because the Bay Area had a lot of it. They had buses, they had trains, they had ferry boats. Um, and so I could, in theory, I could go just about anywhere, but in practice, it was really hard to use. And this is about 1990, 91, somewhere in there. So it's, this law called the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, had just been passed. So there was a lot of optimism. 
But in reality, transportation was really hard to use. Um, and I found it to be frustrating almost every day of my life. And I had I, I was a I was an optimist by temperament, but then I'd get out in the world and it was terrible. Yeah. So I joined as a volunteer a committee that one of the transit agencies in the Bay Area had for uh, people with disabilities who could basically come to the agency once a month and staff would like tell us things they were working on and we would give them advice on how to do it better for folks with disabilities. And I went primarily, I think it was like catharsis. Like if I could just tell them what I really think, sure. I'll feel better and maybe they'll listen. What I found was that they really had good intentions. Mm -hmm. These people cared deeply about providing good service, but they had no lived experience. They didn't use it like I used it. They didn't understand the challenges that I was facing in real life trying to use the service. Mm -hmm. And so they were missing the point uh, often. Yeah. And, and, and what I, the conclusion I came to is that I could help them if they would let me. And these folks were very open. They had an entry level planner position. They helped me like trick the HR department into hiring me because I had like no experience. I, I had no, none of the credentials that I should have, but they gave <laughs> me a job. It didn't pay all that much, but I got a job in the industry. That was 1993 and I loved it. And I've been in it ever since. I've worked for public agencies. I've worked for private companies. Uh, all of it has been in the space of accessible transportation or a service called paratransit, which is basically a uh, curb to curb or door to door service that's designed specifically for people with disabilities who can't use buses and trains. Um, and I've worked in all those areas. And my entire focus for my entire career, including, by the way, six years here at our local transit agency in Phoenix, um, working to try to make transportation better for folks with disabilities. Um, and then during the pandemic, um, I, I, had left, I had left the public sector. I went to a private company. Uh, the private company was new in the industry. The pandemic hit, mm. it decimated our industry. So they let me go. And I thought, you know, I have all this experience. Mm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use it and create this business um, you know, to try to help move transportation forward. I love Since, it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's an amazing story. And I love that you shared the trajectory of your life and how this journey has has brought you to this point. And I've got to ask, mm -hmm. we said we were talking about this in the green room uh, briefly, but I feel like a lot of nonprofits, they, they drill down on what their service is and they work so hard to put it together, find space, and then they they think, OK, I'm going to open the door and everybody will come. They don't address transportation for not only their clients, but other types of communities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of talk to us about that. And do you see that? I mean, do nonprofits seem to have a grip on this or is this one of those things that doesn't even show up until maybe it's too late? I think it probably varies. Uh, I'm, I've certainly seen examples that are good examples where they get it. Um, so first off, let me just get, uh, throw a couple of numbers out there. So depending on which survey, you know, which survey and which data source you like, somewhere between about 19% and 25% of the U.S. population has a disability. Um, and many of those folks have disabilities that impact their ability to, to drive and to use kind of traditional conventional public transportation. So, so, so that's about between one in five and one in four of the people in society um, struggle in some way or another with disability and, and potentially with transportation. But there's another number that to me is even more compelling and it's one that, that people don't often consider, uh, including by the way, the transportation industry. Um, according to the American Community Survey, and I think this is a 2017 number, so it's probably even higher today, Right, 53%, so more than half of us, are closely connected to a person with disabilities. That could be a family member, that could be a coworker, that mm 
that could be uh, someone that shares your house with you. It, but, but if you think about, you know, we tend to think of accessible transportation, the services for disabled people, we tend to think of them as niche, as for somebody else. But more than half of us are in a household or at work or, or you know, in some relationship with a person who needs these services. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a really big deal. And if you think about it from a nonprofit's perspective, more, so even if you're, if you're, well, first off, if your agency is working with customers, with people that you're serving in the community who come to a facility or to a job site or to a kitchen or to whatever service you're providing, a fourth or a fifth of them have disabilities and more than half of them are concerned about somebody who does. Right. Um, but it also means your volunteers. It means your employees. It affects recruitment. It affects everything you do as an organization. And I think some agencies understand it. I think some are not as clear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can dig more into that. But when you think about where do you put a group home? Where do you put a kitchen? Where do you put a job training site? Yeah. Or how do you work with local transportation to meet the needs of your clients and employees? And, and hey, what about board members who are trying to get to your meeting, you know, trying to get to your agency? I love that you brought that up. And and I think it's um, it's a fascinating discussion because it seems to me that especially if you're looking at your footprint and your physical footprint of where you're going to locate, where you're going to operate, um, these, these questions have got to come forward at that time and not after the fact when, you know, you've already put the down payment on the building or you've built your facility or you've signed the long-term lease, whatever that may, that may be. Um, really an interesting interesting conversation and I want to switch gears a little bit because we have um, somebody who's written in a question and mm -hmm. it's it's I'm going to go ahead and read it to you our viewer writes being visually impaired myself I agree with Ron that this is a significant issue question what does the future hold for accessible transportation and we were going to lead into this but um Let's let's go ahead and, and answer this viewer's question. Sure. So I just um, had the opportunity to uh, write a chapter in a friend of mine. His name is Paul Comfort, and he just published a book called The Future of, of Public Transportation. It just actually just came out on May 1st. Awesome. And my chapter is The Future of Paratransit. And paratransit is a service that's designed for folks with disabilities who cannot use buses or trains. Uh, and I would say the future for paratransit is bright. Uh, right now, paratransit in most communities is advanced reservation, meaning you have to book a day in advance. It's shared ride, which means you never know how long your trip is going to take. Uh, mm. And it could take a long time. And it's legally allowed to be to cost up to twice as much as for anybody else, which is crazy. Wow. Um, but I think the future is the future points to change. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that the future for accessible transportation um, includes um, a greater use of artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles. And there are people uh, who are actively working to make that technology accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, I live in Phoenix, where I'm able to use a commercial service called Waymo, Waymo. Uh, which mm -hmm. is pretty slick. Um, because as a non-driver who's never been able to drive a vehicle, mm -hmm. I can now summon a vehicle with my mobile phone. Mm -hmm. I can go ride in that vehicle um, and I can go wherever you know I need to go and I don't have to depend on somebody to do it. Um, so I think the future is bright. I think there's a lot of work to be done. We haven't begun and I think you know, we may get into a little bit of discussing navigation to and from public transportation, which is another which is probably the biggest barrier uh, for a lot of folks with disabilities is getting to and from. Public transit is largely accessible. The buses have lifts, they have ramps, the drivers um, are trained. Um, they're not always effective, but they are trained. 
uh, to provide to provide service. Yeah. Um, you know, we have announcements on the vehicles that tell you where they are. I mean, we've done a lot as an industry, but if you can't get to the bus or the train because there's not a good sidewalk, uh, or if you're in my neighborhood where all the trees aren't trimmed and they hang down over the sidewalk and they make it hard to, to get by safely, mm -hmm. yeah, those kinds of barriers are out in the community and we have to work on those. Um, but, but yeah, I think the future's bright. Uh, we just have work to do. You know, we only have about 10 more minutes left. And um, I want to, you, you brought up so many interesting things. I want to spend this last 10 minutes or so on how we can advocate for this, this issue mm -hmm. of accessible transportation. How can we in our space in the nonprofit sector really look towards serving this massive population which I have to believe is only going to grow as we have an aging demographic. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make this so that we're, we're, we're setting ourselves up to be more in tune with what our community needs? Yep. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on three things and I'm going to try to do it quick. Uh, <laughs> first off, thinking about our facilities. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be on the board of a local nonprofit and they're very much committed to accessibility and they did a really good job with their programs, but their building itself was not super accessible. I mean, it was accessible for people in wheelchairs um, and it had braille signs and all that, but, but I couldn't navigate it because I couldn't find my way from the, the nearest bus stop to the actual building because I had to go through their parking lot. And so one of the things that, that, that Accessible Avenue is, is interested in is helping people navigate what we call wayfinding, which is technology that helps folks navigate through facilities. So designing your facilities to be accessible in terms of both the physical building, but also helping create the kind of technology, and it's not expensive technology, um, to make sure that people can navigate your space um, is one thing that, that, that agencies can do. And when you think about your space, remember that the parking lots are part of your space. <laughs> And yeah. a lot of people who come to your building may be coming via public transit or they may be walking. Um, so that's also important. The second thing I want to talk about is digital accessibility. And I know you've had shows on the nonprofit show focused on digital accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to emphasize it because the law is changing. So mm -hmm. if your agency provides services for public, for state and local government, if you have any contracts to do work or grants, to do work on behalf of state and local governments, you're probably gonna need to make sure that your website and your mobile apps, if you have any, are accessible for people with disabilities uh, and people who use assistive technology. You probably have two or three years to do it, depending on your size, uh, but it's coming. So digital accessibility is super, super important. Uh, and it's an area that, that you're gonna need to put emphasis. The third area, and, and the reason that that matters is because when people come to your agency, they usually start by coming to your website or your mobile app. That's mm -hmm. where they're going to learn where you are. They're going to learn what you offer and how to get it. So it's super important to be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. The third thing, and, and this is where it's really kind of down to the brass tacks of transportation, is understanding that transportation is important and that it's local. Um, and it's 100% local. I mean, there's federal laws that govern it, but all decisions about when transportation is offered, where it's offered, how long it's offered, what it costs, uh, those are local decisions. Yeah. And you need to be involved. You need to know about these issues. So what I recommend, and, and, and we do training for stuff like this, but on your own as an agency, finding somebody, whether it's staff or a board member or a volunteer who can be your transportation guru, who can learn about um, you know, how transportation works in your community, where the meetings take place, where that transit agency's board meets and when, uh, who can go and speak to the concerns that your agency has, mm -hmm. um, who can speak on behalf of your clients who are maybe experiencing challenges using transportation, um, and who can make sure that, that your agency's needs are heard by your local transit agency. Uh, and, you know, and, and part of that too is also bringing them to you, you know, inviting your transit agency to come and speak uh, at your events, um, 
inviting them to serve on your committees so that they're familiar with what you do and the work you do. I think those are all things that any agency can do immediately to to make transportation a little bit more a part of your mission and what you do. You know, those are great ideas. And and that is, um, I love, love, love that you started that this is, a, it might have federal implications and guidelines, but the local nature of this is so important. And that goes back to relationships. And we talk about this with our donors and how we steward and navigate, you know, the nonprofit sector as a whole. Um, I love that you talked about this. I also think it's really powerful that you called out the, you know, your board to say, look, we need a champion of this, somebody that can run this down and really become that, that impact expert, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant idea. And, and that is a form of advocacy that can really make, uh, God, it could change. The, the trajectory of your organization could change with that because these transportation folks have, you know, in terms of um, public policy and, and you know, um, government leadership, they have to go back to all these other agencies. You know, they don't work in a vacuum. I mean, that's that's a, correct. That's a way to really um, imbue your work with a sense of maybe connectivity to, to your local government or to your regional government or even state government. Um, and we don't do that enough. We think it's all legislative, but I think what you pointed out today is really powerful, really powerful. Um, it, it's really been fun to talk with you, Ron. Um, hard to believe our time is almost up. I mean, I, I don't I went so fast. I told you it would go by crazy fast <laughs> and it goes by fast for me too. Um, we're going to throw up the, some information about Ron Brooks, Ron Brooks, CEO of Accessible Avenue. You can find uh, more about Ron accessibleavenue.net. That's accessibleavenue.net. We have this wonderful image of you on the screen um, where you are with your service animal, a beautiful lab by the name of York. Yeah. And uh, you get to learn more about Ron on his website and, and the work that Accessible Avenue is doing. This has been a really um, enlightening conversation for me personally. I also think that, uh, Ron, you, you took the conversation in a direction I didn't expect, drawing us in, in a more complete picture with the use of government officials agencies, other nonprofits, our board members, um, not just that one client, but the whole ecosystem of it and your stats about who is who do we need to re be thinking about um, when you give that number 19% of our population. Um, this is a this is a, a real thing that we need to be talking about. And so I'm just delighted that we had this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, um, again, check out Ron Brooks, CEO, Accessible Avenue at www.accessibleavenue.net. And you can learn more about their amazing work. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out on the, the uh, nonprofit show. Ron, I, I told you, I warned you that we were gonna uh, do our sign off and and I love the message that you left with us today. And that message resonates with us differently every day. And today, I'm thinking of something different when I, when I say this message as well. And the message is stay well so you can do well. Ron Brooks, you're a rock star. Thank you so much. Thank you.